Hi everyone, this is Ron Coddington, the editor of Military Images Magazine, welcoming you to the inaugural episode of Military Images Live, or Am I Live? Uh, first, I want to thank all of you for tuning in, for all of you who subscribe to the magazine, magazine and for all of you who have, who have supported us for so so many years. Uh, thank you very very much on behalf of not only me but the entire Military Images team. I want to start tonight by uh, asking or thinking about uh, a simple question and that is why are you tuning in or why do you care so much about Civil War photography? And I want to share my own perspective with you, uh, and I would be eager to hear some of your own thoughts on this through private messages or on our Facebook page. Um, when I think about Civil War photography, uh, the first images, as many of you know, the images by Matthew Brady, by Alexander Gardner, and others who were uh, operating during the wartime, taking those wonderful outdoor images they were seen by the American public uh, during the war itself. And since that time, they've been featured in many books. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Miller's 10 volume Civil War series know exactly what I'm talking about. Those battlefield images, those outdoor images have been in America's memory for more than 150 years. That's not so true with the portrait photography. The photographs of soldiers and sailors, they've been with the families for more than a hundred years, really up into the 1950s and the 1960s, a hundred years after the war ended. About that time, some of those images began to leave the families, and there's a bunch of reasons why that happened. One reason is because the images uh, began, the folks, the families began to lose track with who those soldiers were, who those sailors were that were posing. Uh, they also started to put them into flea markets, into garage sales. They made their way into collectors' uh, collections. At first they were free, later on they were uh, made available at small prices, and the collector's market grew from there. So since then, since really the 1960s and then more so in the 1970s, the idea of collecting Civil War portrait photography became a phenomenon that grew into a whole area of collecting. And of course now, with Military Magazine, with all the pages on Facebook, uh, including Civil War Faces Marketplace and others, there's wonderful places to have discussions about the soldier images. It's an important place to learn about the scholarship. Uh, it's an important place to talk about who these men are, who they were, and what they did to really bring their stories to life again through their stories, through their uniforms, through the guns that they carried, through the equipment that they wore. So this whole area of scholarship is relatively new. It's only been around, as I mentioned, since the 1960s. So really we're looking at a period of about 50 or 60 years that's much younger than Civil War battlefield photography, which enjoys more than a 150 year exposure to be able to talk about those photographs and discuss them. So here we are in uh, our first uh, episode. So and I wanted to get that out just so we could understand that Civil War photography, portrait photography is something that's new. It's something that is, there's plenty of work to be done. There's so much to learn. And I think that we're only scratching the surface after 50 years. Imagine what it's going to be like in another 10, 15, or 20 years. We're going to find out. So um, moving on, I want to uh, talk about some of the most often asked questions that I get. And um, by far, the most uh, popular question is, how come you don't publish more Confederate images? And it's a great question. Uh, and my explanation is a fairly simple one. For those of you who have looked at the number of soldiers that served in the Union Army, you know that there's a total of about 2.1 million. I did some figuring uh, a few years ago and came up with an estimate 
of just about how many photographs I thought were made during the Civil War only on the Union side. And what I factored into my decision was images that soldiers took in the beginning of the war as they were leaving home. Those who were able to have a photograph made during the war at at least one point, maybe a second point, and then of uh, those who survived had another image made. If you add all those together and considering the resources of the North, in my estimation, there's as many as 40 million images. That's a lot of photos. If only 10% of those images survive, then we're looking at 4 million that are somewhere out there today. Uh, some are in collections, some are still with families, some are in museums and institutions. So there's a ton of images that are out there. Many of them are still waiting to be found. So what about Confederate images? As you know, much smaller number of soldiers served. We're looking at about 1 million Confederate soldiers compared to 2.1 million Union soldiers. Those million soldiers, I'm sure some number of them had their photograph made at the beginning of the war, much as their Union counterparts did. These were young men who were wearing uniforms, many for the first time, and they wanted to show their family and friends what they looked like. So that's not uncommon. What is different from the Union, in addition to the smaller number of soldiers, is the effectiveness of the blockade, the Union blockade on Confederate supplies, and of course, the invading Union armies taking over Confederate territory. What I think we're looking at here is far fewer images that were made during the war on the Confederate side. In fact, one collector of Mississippi images told me it's really hard to find any images made in that state between 1862 and 1865. Now, those who survived the war, some number of them posed for their photograph. And that number, I think, was pretty small when you realize that they had to, they could only wear their uniforms for a certain period of time. It was, uh, I think, in the summer or the early fall of 1865 when the federal government made it illegal to wear a Confederate uniform. So there's a small window of time, a small opportunity where now former Confederate soldiers could pose for photographs. So based on all of those factors, my feeling, my opinion, is that maybe there's about 3 million photographs that were taken during the war. That's far fewer than the 40 million that I estimate for the Union side. So with that very, very small number, you might be left with tens of thousands uh, of Confederate images, maybe a few hundred thousand at the most. So that's a big, big difference compared to Union soldiers. So uh, we're very aware of that at Military Images, and so we try to seek balance. If we sought balance with the actual numbers of images, we'd only have maybe one Confederate image for every 10 or 20 Union images. Uh, we actually try hard to ensure a better balance so that we have enough Confederate images, enough Confederate material to talk about. So, um, for example, I've got a couple of printouts of covers of military images so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, in the last 20, uh, 20 issues that we've published, nine of them have had Confederate soldiers or Confederates on the front. So we're actually better than the average if you want to slice it and evaluate it based on the estimates that I just gave out. So something to keep in mind. Now, I want to talk about a few of um, uh, an image that caught my attention last week. Uh, and this is one that came out of the Gettysburg Show. You can see it right here. And um, it was originally discussed as possibly a hospital steward. And the reason that the idea of a hospital steward came up is because of this area right here. You can see what appears to be a um, silk ribbon that looks like it has some sort of a writing on it. And uh, it's easy to imagine 
that there could be a symbol of a caduceus on there, which would indicate that he was some sort of a medical person, some sort of a hospital steward, or potentially some sort of a cadet that worked in the medical section of, uh, of the Union uh, hospitals. So, if we take a closer look, here's a closer look at that sleeve, and you can see clearly a stripe that appears to be made out of some sort of a um, matte colored fabric, and then below it is another one, and in the middle is that very silky colored, uh, or pardon me, very silky textured material. So you got to wonder what's going on there. I can tell you for sure that, and you can see this yourself, there's no caduceus there. Um, it is simply the way the silken material is puckering as it was sewed on to um, his uniform sleeve. So what's going on there? Um, there's two theories. One of them, and I'll go back to this one, uh, one of them is that there, it's a veteran, it's a very elaborate veteran stripe. Some of you, some of those, uh, some of you who know Union uniforms will realize that the veterans, uh, as a mark of their veteran status when they re-enlisted, they were entitled to put a stripe on their sleeve. Uh, in the regular army, you would put a stripe for every five years of service. So this is suggestive. Now, another detail worth thinking about in the same image is this soldier's hat. You can see clearly that there's the infantry horn, that there's the number six, which is reg his regimental number, and his company letter, which is B. So it's pretty easy to conclude that he served in Company B of the 6th Regiment. And since this image was taken in Massachusetts, it's possible that he served in Company B of the 6th Massachusetts Infantry. Now, the 6th Massachusetts Infantry is of interest because during the war, they were activated for, um, uh, for federal duty or called up for federal duty on three separate occasions. Famously, in 1861, uh, which included the uh, march through Baltimore, known as the Pratt Street Riots, when pro-secession mobs uh, or pro-secession supporters attacked the 6th Massachusetts, they were also called up twice more uh, in 1863 and 1864. So, if you've got uh, those three tours of duty, is it very possible that what we're looking at here is three service stripes for their three tours of duty. And that first tour of duty, the one that really put them on the map and made them part of history when they marched through Baltimore, maybe that stripe, that silky stripe, represents that famous march. So, I wanted to share that with you. Uh, this, by the way, is still a work in progress. Remember what I said about scholarship around these uniforms and around these images. We really don't know um, uh, all the fine details of how these soldiers wore their uniforms. These are the kinds of details we're trying to unearth as we're looking through all these images. There's more. Another, uh, I want to get back to the questions. One of the questions, another question I get asked very often is, uh, can you help me find my great-great-grandfather, or can you help me find out about a certain regiment or a certain soldier that I'm interested in? Uh, and can you take a look at your back issues of your magazine and tell me? And I'd love to do that. Uh, for many years, it was a difficult question to answer because military images for much of its history has been uh, in print only. Uh, with the advent of the digital age in the 1990s, of course, we made the transition like everyone else. But having a digital edition eluded the magazine until 2014 when we started offering PDFs and then a digital native version, which is available through our website. Uh, these uh, digital editions only cover a few years of the magazine. That is, until very recently, when we were contacted by jstore.org, uh, that's short for journal, journal storage, uh, J-S-T-O-R dot O-R-G. 
JSTOR is a company, it's a nonprofit, and their business is to save historic journals that they feel are important to American history. They invited military images to participate, and over the last couple of years, they've digitized uh, f almost 40 years worth of issues, and that includes tens of thousands of portraits of soldiers and sailors from the American Civil War. So I would urge you, if you're interested in finding uh, about various regiments or specific soldiers, to visit jstore.org. So, like all websites, uh, learning how to navigate can be a bit of a challenge, but we've put together a handy tip sheet, and if you go to militaryimagesmagazine.com and look under our back issues, you can find how to make the most of your military images search on JSTOR. We've got tips uh, to help you maximize your search experience and find what you're looking for. So, I've got one more item to share with you uh, this evening. And that is another question that I get often asked, and it's about how to store your paper photographs. Specifically, how to store your carts de visite or card photographs. Well, uh, over time, the various uh, makers of archival sleeves have come in and out of the marketplace. In fact, there was one that I was using for some years, and they recently announced that they were no longer going to make CDV sleeves. So I was in a position to have to hunt around and find what I thought was the best protection for the paper photographs. And so I experimented with several different brands and I eventually landed with a company called, right here, uh, Gaylord Archival. Uh, they make a sleeve that I found to be really um, easy to use and one that I thought does a great job at protecting the photographs. Um, I don't know if you can see it here, but it's a single sleeve and it opens on the side. There is a little edge that folds over and it comes apart like this. So it's sort of like a little frame that opens up. And just to demonstrate how it works, I have a CDV. Here's Colonel Elmer Ephraim Ellsworth um, of, uh, of New York. Uh, many of you know him as the famous drill master. Uh, of the United States uh, Zouaves um, before the war, I've got his image here. And so if you simply slide it in like this and sort of tuck it along this bottom edge of the sleeve, the sort of hard edge of the sleeve, and then take the handy little folder part at the top, almost like an envelope, cover it over, give it a seal, boom. Now the kernel is very well protected and um, these again are available through Gaylord Archive um, and uh, you can find them at www.gaylord.com. So that's all I have for this evening on this very first inaugural episode of Military Images Live. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please let me know what you think. Um, and uh, if you liked it, please send along questions. I'd love to answer them for you. And um, if you send them in early enough, I can reach out to our network of senior editors and get some additional information for you. Uh, and um, I hope to hear from you soon. So take care. Thanks for tuning in. And have a great evening. Bye.